This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Ready. Jesus, man, I just got back and I'm tired. Welcome back, everybody. Let's see if we can get our head back in the game. It's not so easy, somehow. I'm sure I speak for all of you. <laughs> anyway, I hope everybody had a very good holiday, either here or elsewhere, and that we can now sprint to the finish. All right, I want to wrap up today uh, the discussion on LTI systems. There are a lot of topics to do, a lot of little things to do, a lot of big things to do, and uh, like many things in this class, um, it goes off in a lot of different directions, and it's often the subject of very specialized uh, courses. I was going to do some material on uh, a little bit more on filters, on digital filters today, but I decided not to do that. It's discussed in the notes, and there is, of course, an entire, uh, we have an entire course on digital filters, so you have plenty of opportunity to see it. If you don't see it there, you'll see it elsewhere, um, worked into other courses. So I thought I would just do some fairly general things, do a couple of sample calculations, and talk about the relationship, the connection between the LT, uh, LTI linear time invariant systems and the Fourier transform, which is the main sort of uh, important fundamental uh, foundational information that I think everybody ought to be sure that they know. So let me remind you where we finished up last time. Last time we got a pretty satisfactory um, answer about the general structure of linear systems in terms of the impulse response. So if L is a linear system, L a linear system, then we introduce the impulse response, a function of two variables separately, L of xy is L of delta x minus y. And then the basic result which is known in the, in the theory of distributions as the Schwartz kernel theorem. But for us, it's something you probably heard about when you, when you heard your first, um, when you had your first course in signals and systems, that the output of the system can be given in terms of integrating the impulse response against the input. All right? So if w of x is equal to l of v of x, then you actually get w of x is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of h of xy, v of y, dy. All right? So um, once again, the output of the system is obtained by taking the input of the system and integrating that against the impulse response. That's a very satisfactory result. Now, in the special case when you have an LTI system, the uh, integration reduces the convolution. So let me remind you what an LTI system is. You say that L is time invariant or shift invariant. Invariant, get the word better here, or shift invariant if the following happens. Say if w is equal to l of x, l of v of x, sorry, then w of x minus y is equal to l of v of x minus y. I'll write it in the symbols. It's easier to say in words. L is time invariant if a delay of the input results in a corresponding delay of the output. All right, so if V is the output of L, V is the, out, if v is the input and W is the output, V of X minus Y is the delayed form of V, then W of X minus Y is the delayed form of W, and it says delayed inputs correspond to delayed outputs. And a system is time invariant or shift invariant if and only if the impulse response is given by, or the integral is given by convolution, okay? So in this case, the impulse response for an LTI system is a little bit easier. Delta of x, I just set to be L of eight, L of, I'll get it, I'll get it again. I'll get it right. H of x is L of the unshifted delta function, say delta of x. And then by the time invariance, H of x minus y is equal to delta, is equal to L of delta x minus y. So that is the impulse response. And the action of the system is given by w of x, the output is the integral from minus infinity to infinity, h of x minus y, v of y, dy. Same form, right? Integrating 
the, the output of the system is given by integrating against the impulse response, but now the impulse response is of a special form. It's not a it doesn't depend on x and y separately, it depends only on their difference. And we recognize this as a convolution. Okay, this is h star v at x. And in fact, this is characteristic of time invariant systems. That is to say, a system is time invariant, a linear system is time invariant if and only if it's given by a convolution. So a system is time invariant if and only if, if it's given by a convolution. All right. That's where we finished up last time. All right. And it's, a, again, a very satisfactory state of affairs as far as the structure of linear systems go. Any linear system is given by integration against the impulse response. The system is time invariant if and only if that integration reduces to a convolution. So it's another indication of how fundamental convolution is in the whole theory. All right. Or, or as, as just as an operation, we're going to see how the Fourier transform comes into this in just a second. Because any time should be one of the great lessons of this class is that any time anybody mentions convolution, bells should go off in your head suggesting that you take the Fourier transform. But wait. All right, we'll do that in just a minute. I did want to comment. All this was in the context of continuous time systems. But I did want to comment. Um, and a matter of fact, just write down a simple example that the same sort of consideration holds when you have um, discrete systems. All right, same considerations hold for discrete systems. All right. That, now, any discrete system remembers multiplication by a matrix. All right. If W is equal to L of V, then this is given by. So I'm, into, I'm, I'm drawing. The, I'm, I'm thinking about this. L and V is. Are you in W and V as vectors here? It's given by multiplication by a matrix. All right, we talked about that before. Any linear operator is given by multiplication by a matrix. Any finite dimensional linear operator is given by multiplication by a matrix. And it is this, the definition of um, shift invariance or time invariance is the same as before, except this time you're shifting a discrete variable instead of a continuous variable. And again, you have But a system is time invariant or shift invariant if and only if it's given by convolution. This, in this case, vector convolution or um, matrix convolution, well, vector convolution. So L is an LTI if and only if um, W is equal to H star V. Okay? Now, in this case, so here H is the impulse response, V is the input vector, and W is the output vector. All right? So again, H is. L of delta, all right, the unshifted delta function. And H of m minus n is, del is L of delta sub, let me write this, n minus m, is L of the delta function shifted to m. Now, it's interesting, I just wanted to show you this as an example. To do a, I want to do a couple of calculations today sort of so you'll feel comfortable with how these things work out. Um, the matrix A that realizes the, the uh, linear system has a special form in the case of a time invariant system. It's cute. And actually, it's very important in a lot of, in a number of applications. So again, L is given by, uh, the operator is given by matrix multiplication. If we write the system as a matrix multiplication, say again, let me write it. A times V, all right, where A is a matrix, then A is a special form for time invariant systems. Let me just do, rather than trying to give you a state of general theorem here, let me just do an example so you see how it works. All right, so let's take. Take EG. Let's take just a four by four system. So I'm going to take H to be the matrix or the vector 
Uh, one, two, three, four. All right, just to take a random example that I happened to work out in detail before I got here, so I wouldn't make any mistakes. Um, so if w is equal to a times v, which is also given by h convolved with v, the question is, what is a? All right. So I'm, I'm telling you the system is given by convolution. All right, h star v, where h is, get, h is this vector. Now, it's a linear system, so any linear system is given by matrix multiplication. The question is, what is the matrix? All right, so it's clear what, what I'm asking here. Well, how do you find the matrix A? How do you find any matrix A? You have to find the image of the basis vectors. All right, the columns of A are given by A of... Well, the first basis vector is just what we're calling, in fancier language, delta naught. Delta naught is 1, 0, 0, 0, all right? The first column, the, that's the first column. The second column is a delta 1. Delta 1 is 0, 1, 0, 0. If I use the language of delta functions instead of the language of linear algebra. Um, second column, the next column is a delta 2. And the last column is a delta 3. So a delta 2, delta 2 is 0, 0, 1, 0. I'm indexing here, remember, there's always this problem when you're, when you're working with, in the, in the sort of context of linear systems, DFTs, et cetera, where the indexing is usually from 0 to n minus 1 instead of from 1 to n, all right? So delta 0 is, this is the 0th slot, the first slot, the second slot, the third slot, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Uh, and the final column is a delta 3 where delta 3 is the last basis vector, that's 0, 0, 0, 1. All right, so how do I compute all these things? Well, I compute them by convolution, all right, because by definition, the system is given to you as convolution with the vector h. So a of delta naught is h convolved with delta naught. All right, now, what is h convolved with delta naught? Wait, don't tell me. I know. It's h, all right? Convolving with, it with the unshifted delta function doesn't do anything to the vector. It's h. All right, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4. If I write it as a column. Okay? What about h, what about a of delta 1? What is a of delta 1? Is h convolved with delta 1? Now, what, is it, what, what do you get if you convolve h with the shifted delta function? It's a shift of h, all right? h convolved with delta 1 at the index m is h of m minus 1, okay? Just like the ordinate, just like the continuous case, just like the continuous case, all right? So what is that? Well. Now, here's where you have to say something a little extra, all right? If h is the vector 1, 2, 3, 4, what is h shifted by 1? All right. Now, you have to use the fact that h has to be assumed. Anytime convolution comes into the picture, we haven't brought the DFT in, although we will, but anytime any, any of that sort of stuff comes in, you always have to assume that your signals, your discrete signals, are extended to be periodic, all right? So that it makes sense to consider h for values other than the indices, indices 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. Remember, it's index 0, 1, 2, 3, all right? So it makes sense to consider h defined for all integers, and you just keep repeating the pattern, all right? So what is h, h convolved with delta 1 as a vector? He looks at his notes to make sure. How do you what do you get when you if you shift it? It's shifted like one to the right, right? You know, if I look at f of x minus one, it's like shifts, x, shifts the function over. Four, one, two, three. All right, make sure you see this, okay? Again, you have to assume that h is extended to be periodic, 
and it's shifted down by one. So if shifted down by one, the four goes up top. Or you, you, you can think of it this way. H, H, the, the zeroth component here is h of minus one, right? Delta one convolved with h at zero is h of minus one. But h of minus one is the same thing as h of three because of the periodicity. And h of three is the third component. Remember, we're indexing 0, 1, 2, 3, so that's 4, and so on, OK? What is, what about the rest of them? Now you see what the pattern is. What is a of delta 2? Is that where I am now? Yes, yeah, so that's h composed with, that's not composed, h is convolved with delta 2. So that's h shifted by 2, or I guess shift this thing one more. So what would this be? I should ask. Pardon me? Be bold. Thank you. <laughs> All right, shift it down again. And finally, H A of delta 3 is H convolved with delta 3. That shifts H by 3. And that is 2, 3, 4, 1, right? Yeah. All right. Now, again, those are the four columns of the matrix A. So what is the matrix A? What is the matrix A? Or simply, what is the matrix? Neo. A is 1, 2, 3, 4. This, that's the first column. The second column is, what do I have there? 4, 1, 2, 3. Third column was 3, 4, 1, 2. 4 by 4 matrix. And the final column is 2, 3, 4, 1. All right? So again, and you can check, you can check that this is a different description of the system. That is, the system is given by, it's given by convolution, but it's also given by matrix multiplication. W is equal to A times V. That is, A times V, multiplying matrix, matrices out, is the same thing as convolving with H. Now, this is kind of cool matrix, all right? If you look at this matrix, this is, what, this is what's called a circulant matrix in the biz. And I think I actually mentioned this once before. Somebody asked a little bit about this. Circulant matrix. All right. This is a special case of more general matrices called triplets matrices. They come up in a lot of different applications of discrete systems. All right. Circulant matrix is it's uh, constant on the diagonals. The, 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 the columns are periodic, as they are in this case. So the pattern just repeats, just cycles around. And each column is obtained from the previous column by a shift. And consequently, it's constant on the diagonal. So it's constant on the main diagonal. All ones, fours here, threes here, two, twos, threes, four, and so on. OK? And it's called circulant. That sort of property, if it's constant on the diagonal elements, I can't, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to give you the general definition here because I don't want to give it wrong. But it's a standard. There's standard terminology. There's standard matrices that come up a lot in various applications, triplets matrices and circulant matrices. And they have this, the circulant matrices are like triplets matrices, except they have the additional property that the columns are periodic. Okay, that the, the, the columns are just, uh, the, each one is obtained from the, from the previous one by a shift. Okay? Bob Gray in our department has a whole book on, has a whole book on a lot of things actually, but <laughs> has a whole book in particular on triplets matrices and, and their applications. All right, so they, they actually come up a lot. We'll come back to this matrix a little bit later. All right? It's kind of cool. And it's the sort of calculation that you should be able to do. All right? You know, you should be able to take this results in the continuous case and put and bring it over to the discrete case and realize what form it takes and realize that it's not so different than what you're doing in the continuous case. I, we, we set it up this way just so the formalism, so the, so the symbols and everything else would look as much as possible like the continuous case. It's nice. Okay, now, at long last, let's bring back the Fourier transform for LTI systems. LTI systems given by convolution. Bell should go off in your head. Buzzers should go off in your pocket. Who knows what else should happen? But whatever happens, you should think of the Fourier transform. Bring in the Fourier transform. All right, so 
This is only for an LTI system where you have, where you have convolution. So if W is equal to H convolved with V, V is the input, W is the output, H is the impulse response. So H is fixed and V varies over different inputs. And if you take the Fourier transform, you of course get by the convolution theorem, the Fourier transform of W is the Fourier transform of H times the Fourier transform of V. Or it is, as it is universally written in uppercase letters, capital W is equal to capital H of S times capital V of S. And in this context, in terminology that, again, I'm sure you have heard, capital H of S is called the transfer function. Little h is called the impulse response. Capital H is called the transfer function. I guess you have to be a little careful here. That's all right. Never mind. Sometimes what you call the impulse response, whether you call the impulse response h of x or h of x minus y, I guess that's the only question, but it's not important in this case. Anyway, uh, the, but the standard terminology that, again, I'm sure you have heard, and I think we even used back when we talked about filters when we first started talk about, talking about convolution, is the capital H is called the transfer function. It's also sometimes called the system function. Any other terms for this anybody knows, just out of curiosity? Called the capital H function? I don't know. You need to call it either the system function or the transfer function. Now, I want to point out something here, again, sort of in the spirit of there's such beautiful structure involved in linear systems. I, when we start talking about linear systems, I said, I made the bold statement, that um, the most basic example of linear system is the, is the relationship of direct proportionality. The output is directly proportional to the input. All right? And I said, boldly, that any linear system is somehow some generalization of that, or somehow you can trace back the idea of direct proportionality, or you can read direct proportionality into any linear system. And for LTI systems, this is staring you in the face, all right? Because what this says is that for an LTI system in the frequency domain, it's exactly described by multiplication. It's exactly described by direct proportionality, okay? In the frequency domain, the system is really given by direct proportion, the relationship of direct proportion. In the time domain, it's a little more complicated. In the time domain, it involves convolution. But in the frequency domain, it really is the relationship between the input and the output is given by direct proportion, the most basic relationship that underlies linearity. All right? And of course, Again, we have, you know, part of the point of this course is that the time domain and the frequency domain in some sense are equivalent. You can pass back and forth between the two. They're different pictures of the same thing, different views of the same phenomena. You can use one to study the other, all right? So again, I just, I just wanted to point this out because I, th I think it's just another, I don't know, example of how, how, how beautifully unified and coherent the subject is when you, when you talk about linearity and in particular time and variance and convolution, that this whole idea of, again, direct proportion comes out very strongly here. Okay. It's not just almost there, it's there. It's right in front of you. Now, the importance of bringing in the Fourier transform to LTI systems is <coughs> um, the fact, and it would not be obvious if you, had not, if you didn't do it with Fourier transforms, that um, complex exponentials are eigenfunctions for LTI systems. All right, let me write that down and then I'll ex explain what I mean. Now, this is sort of the last general fact that we're going to talk about for, for linear systems and LTI systems in particular. So the last great fact on LTI systems is that complex exponentials are eigenfunctions. Now, this actually is an extremely important result, but we are not going to take it anywhere, all right? I sort of regret to say, just because, again, this goes off in a lot of different directions and becomes, I mean, it's, you see this more, the, you see the importance of this more in special applications. And you'll, you, I would not be, I would be surprised if you didn't see this in special applications. But for us, I just want to make sure you understand where it comes about and why and, and how it happens, what the, what the basic definition is. So we're not going to do any particular applications of this because to do one application is to do dozens of applications probably. And, and again, you'll probably see these more in other courses. It comes up a lot in quantum mechanics, comes up, in, up a lot in various aspects of signal processing. 
Um, but I just want to, I want to make sure you see the basic fact. So here's what I mean by this. So again, L of V is given by H star V. Okay? L is, and so it's a time invariant system. Let's call it W on the left hand side. W is the output, V is the input. And if I take the Fourier transform, I get W of S is equal to H of S times V of S. Now, what happens if I input a complex exponential into the system? Input v of x is e to the 2 pi i nu times x. Any nu, OK? And the question is, what is L of v of x? I think sometimes people call this the frequency response because you're inputting a pure frequency or a pure harmonic. All right, but I tend not to use that term. Anyway, what is it? Well, um, what is, well, first of all, what is the Fourier transform? A Fourier transform e to the 2 pi i nu x. Let's let's work with the that is let's work with the work in the frequency domain. That is work in the relationship between the Fourier transform of the input of the output function, the Fourier transform of the input function, and the transfer function. All right, so the Fourier transform of e to the two pi i nu x is just delta x minus nu. Okay, it gives you a shifted delta function. And so the output. The output is W of s. The output in the frequency domain is W of s is h of s times delta s minus nu. But now there's the fundamental sampling property of the delta function. h of s times delta of s minus nu is h of nu, a constant, times delta s minus nu. All right? Now take the inverse Fourier transform on both sides. Go back to the time domain. If I go back to the time domain, then h of nu, if I, that is to say, if I take the inverse Fourier transform, h of nu just comes out, tags along for the ride because it's a constant. The inverse Fourier transform of delta, the shifted delta function, is the complex exponential again. So I get w of x is equal to h of nu times e to the 2 pi i nu x. All right? In other words, Remember, the input was e to the 2 pi i nu x. The output is then a multiple of that, namely the value of the transfer function at nu. So i.e., L of e to the 2 pi i nu x is equal to h of nu times e to the 2 pi i nu x. All right? That says exactly that e to the 2 pi i, the complex exponential e to the 2 pi i nu x, is an eigenfunction with eigenvalue h of nu. That's exactly what that statement means. Okay. This says All right, this says exactly e to the 2 pi i nu x is an eigenfunction eigenfunction of any linear system, any LTI system, of any LTI system. Now, it doesn't always have the same eigenvalue because the LTI system depends on the particular transfer function. The eigenvalues for a given LTI system are values of the transfer function at the frequency, nu. The eigenvalues, the corresponding eigenvalue, is h of nu, the value of the transfer function at nu. All right, that's a fundamental fact. And again, some people interpret this. You know, often, I think I probably even put this statement in the notes. If time invariance is some, a further indication of how natural and important convolution is, then the fact that complex exponentials are eigenfunctions is I don't know, either, either a further statement about how important shift invariant or linear uh, time invariant systems are or how important complex exponentials are. 
All right? The fact that they enter into this, the theory of linear systems in such an important way. I can, it's very important in, if you're analyzing a linear system, as I'm sure you've seen in various classes, to know the possible eigenvalues and eigenvectors, if there are eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I say eigenfunction here instead of eigenvector because I'm thinking, of vec I'm thinking of functions instead of vectors. That is a function of a continuous variable x. I'll do the discrete case in just a minute, actually. All right, but same idea. Say it's, it's the same terminology in linear algebra, but just applied as you use in linear algebra, but just applied to sort of the continuous case. Okay. So any LTI system has uh, uh, complex exponentials as actually, a, as it turns out, a basis of eigenfunctions, and that turns out to be very important. That allows you to diagonalize the operators associated with LTI systems and understand how they operate in a much more natural way. But again, I say sort of to do one application is to do a lot of applications, so I would rather let that wait for other occasions. It's, but it's also important to realize that, um, you know, we, all, we often talk about how you can work with complex exponentials, but, you know, it's the same, but really you're sometimes thinking about real signals, so you take the real part and sine and cosine, and, you know, properties of complex exponentials are the same as the properties of sines and cosines and so on and so on. But this is a case where that's not true, all right? That is, it's the complex exponentials that are eigenfunctions of linear, op of linear time invariant systems, not the sine and the cosine separately. So let me show you that. So it's not true. Without additional assumptions, there are some cases where it's true, but generally it's not true that sine and cosine are themselves eigenfunctions of an LTI system. All right, watch what happens here. All right, so let me take, let, let's take cosine for an example. So e.g. take v of x to be a cosine, cosine of 2 pi nu times x. All right, and the question is what is L of v of x? If it's an eigenfunction, L of v of x has to be a multiple of itself, has to be a multiple of v of x. All right, well, is it or not? We can calculate this by expressing the cosine in terms of complex exponentials as the real part. So L of cosine of 2 pi nu x is L of 1 half e to the 2 pi i nu x plus e to the 1 half the, the sum plus e to the minus 2 pi i nu x. All right, L applied to the sum. The 1 half comes out and L is linear, so L of each one of those, the sum of the complex exponentials is the sum of L applied to the complex exponentials. And we know what happens in that case, actually. So this is 1 half. L of e to the 2 pi i nu x plus L of e to the minus 2 pi i nu x. All right? And the complex exponentials are eigenfunctions. All right? So this is 1 half h of nu times e to the 2 pi i nu x plus h of minus nu e to the minus 2 pi i nu x is e to the 2 pi i minus nu times x. So it's h of minus nu e to the minus 2 pi i nu x, one half of that whole thing. And now you're stuck, all right? You are stuck because unless you have additional assumptions, all right, you can't combine these terms. You have h of nu and h of minus nu, and without further assumptions, they don't have anything to do with each other, okay? So you are now stuck. Without further assumptions, okay? So it's not an eigenfunction without further assumptions. Now, there are assumptions that you can make. Actually, one of the most natural assumptions, which almost gets you there, but not quite, is to assume that H is real. What if H, the impulse response, which is, and it's a natural assumption, is real, as it will be in most cases, all right? 
Well, if H is real, then what symmetries does the Fourier transform have? If H is real, then H has a symmetry, symmetry, H of minus nu is equal to H of nu bar. That's a, that's a basic symmetry of the Fourier transform when you take the Fourier transform of a real signal. Okay? So if I plug this in, so let's go with that assumption. And if I go with that assumption, then L of, again, cosine of 2 pi nu x is equal to 1 half h of nu e to the 2 pi i nu x plus h of nu bar. And let me write this as actually e to the 2 pi i nu x bar. All right, e to the minus 2 pi i nu x is a conjugate of e to the 2 pi i nu x. So that is the real part. So that's the real part of h of nu e to the 2 pi i nu x. Now you're still not quite there, right? You're still stuck. I mean, if h of nu were real, then you'd be OK, right? But I'm not assuming that h of nu is real, just that h satisfies the symmetry property. There is a little bit more you can do, all right? Let's write, so you're still stuck. In the sense that it's, it's not an eigenfunction, it's just not. So don't say that it is. Don't make me mad, all right? So if you write, though, there's a little bit more you do, and that's a common thing to do. If I write h in terms of its, um, the polar form, h of nu, the magnitude times e to the, say, i phi, all right, h, h e to the i theta, or e to the i phi, with a phase. So I write in terms of the magnitude and the phase. Then h of nu times. h of nu times e to the 2 pi i nu x is absolute value of h of nu times e to the i phi times this is e to the 2 pi i nu x plus phi. OK? Or I put the 2 pi, yeah, I guess I'll write it like that. So 2 pi i nu x plus, no, 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 2 pi i. I'll get it, I'll get it, don't panic. i times 2 pi nu x, there we go plus phi, OK? So the real part of this does give you a cosine, but it's a phase shifted cosine. The real part of h of nu times e to the 2 pi i nu x is going to be absolute value of h of nu times cosine of times the, uh, the, so the real part of this is this is already real. The real part of this is a cosine with a phase shift. So it's cosine of 2 pi nu x plus phi. OK? Oh, phase shifts always drive people out. All right. So it's still not an eigenfunction, right? But it's as close as you're sort of going to get. This says L of cosine of 2 pi nu x is equal to absolute value of h of nu times cosine of 2 pi nu x plus phi. All right, the cosine is not an eigenfunction, but it's close. OK, yeah? It's even. Well, then, you could, then you're in business. <laughs> the more assumptions you can put on this, because then you'd know, then you'd be OK. All right? There are extra assumptions you can put on here, but all I'm saying is that if you don't put those extra assumptions on, it's just not the case that um, the sines and cosines are separately eigenfunctions for LTI systems. It's only the complex, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, it's only it's really sort of a fundamental difference between the complex world and the real world is that for any LTI system, complex exponentials are eigenfunctions, but not the real and imaginary parts are not eigenfunctions without extra assumptions. Okay? All right, let's finish up. Let's do the discrete case. Let's do the discrete version of this. Again, 
same considerations hold for the discrete case. The discrete case is W is equal to L of V, which is H convolved with V, but everything here now is a discrete signal. Again, W of S, uh, w, of K, or w of, I should call it M, I guess, maybe, is the Fourier transform of H uh, times the Fourier transform of V, but everything is discrete here, okay? And again, um, discrete complex exponentials are eigenfunctions. Discrete complex exponentials are eigenfunctions. All right? Why, or eigen, I should call them, in this case, I should call them eigenvectors, I suppose. All right? So, for example, what if I input v equals omega to the k for any k? So, omega is the discrete vector complex exponential, right, that we've used many times. What if I input omega to the k? Well, f, the Fourier transform of omega to the k is, if you will recall, I don't recall, so I have to write it down, is n times delta k, all right? There's that extra damn factor of n in there that comes in. What are you going to do? It just is. It's a pain in the neck. But there it is. So again, what is L of vk? So to find L of omega to the k, not L of vk, L of omega to the k, look in the frequency domain. Same argument as before. And I get W of, say, n is equal to h of n time, oh, let me just write it like this without the indexes. W is equal to h times, um, this, n times delta k, all right? So that's equal to h of k, n times n times delta k, because of the sampling property of the discrete delta function, same property, same damn thing. The same damn thing over and over again. It's the same argument. So back in the time domain, it's the same thing. W is equal to H of K times uh, omega to the K. Okay, that is to say, i.e., L of omega to the K, the discrete complex exponential, the kth power of the discrete complex exponential is uh, H of K times omega to the k. Now, interesting thing happens here because whereas in the continuous case you had sort of an infinite family to discrete complex exponentials, e to, the, e to the 2 pi nu x where nu can be anything, a continuous variable between minus infinity and plus infinity, here these powers cycle, right? Zero up to the zero to the n minus first power and then they start going, oh, then they start repeating. All right. So what you have is this is a maybe a, a difference, or at least it's a special feature of the of the discrete case. So here, now you see that one omega to the one omega squared up to omega to the n minus one form a basis of eigenvectors for any linear time invariant system. They're independent. They're n of them. They're each eigenvectors. They actually form a basis, and almost an orthonormal basis. They're not quite orthonormal, right, because the lengths are n, not 1. Damn. All right? Form a basis of eigenvectors for any LTI system. All right, now I want to make sure you understand 
again, what this says and what this doesn't say, all right? Any LTI system, these discrete complex exponentials, one, this is the constant, uh, this, is the, this is the vector with all ones in it, all right? One, omega, omega squared up to omega n minus one. Any LTI system, these are eigenfunction, eigenvectors, and they form a basis of eigenvectors, all right? The eigenvalues are different. The eigenvalues depend on the system, because the eigenvalues are the values of the transfer function at the index, k, and that's going to be different for different systems, all right? Because h is going to be different for different systems. To, to, to define a system, an LTI, a discrete LTI system, is to give the h. And so that gives the eigenvalues in each term. But the, but the, but the vectors themselves, 1, omega, omega squared up to omega n minus 1, are eigenvectors for any LTI system. Any, another way of putting this is any LTI system, so a system given by convolution in a discrete case, is diagonalized by the complex exponentials. All right, this is another important property, makes for good quals questions, <laughs> all right? It's an important property of discrete complex exponentials that they form, an, they form a basis of eigenvectors for any LTI system. All right, now, I'll do one more calculation for you. Let's take that system we had before. Let's do a 263 problem in a slightly different way. All right, let's take, again, w is equal to h convolved with v in the discrete case where h was the vector 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, and we found that this was given by matrix multiplication, w is equal to a times v, where a was this matrix, right? a was a matrix, I had to write it down again. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, that's the first column, 1, 2, 3, 4, and I start shifting. 4, 1, 2, 3, then 3, 4, one, 3, 4, and then 3, 4, 1, 2, he said looking at his notes desperately, then 2, 3, 4, 1, all right. All right. That's the matrix, all right? Now, eigenvectors of the system, then, therefore, are eigenvectors of A, all right? of the system are eigenvectors of A. I should say eigenvectors and eigenvalues are eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the matrix A, all right? Let's find them. Now, you know how to do that, actually, by matrix methods where you look at A minus lambda times the identity and figure out the determinant and, you know, figure out the roots of the characteristic polynomial and then solve the thing or you just plug into MATLAB and let MATLAB chuck away and so on and so on, right? So you can do this, but let's solve this problem um, by using what we know, okay? So let's do this via the theory of LTI systems. The eigenvalues are given by um, values of the transfer function, all right? So we need the transfer function. Eigenvalues are h of 0, h of 1, remember I'm indexing 0, 1, 2, 3, h of 2, and h of 3. Those are the eigenvalues. And actually, I know what the eigenvectors are. The eigenvectors, of course, are complex exponentials, all right? So how do I find those numbers? Well, h is the Fourier transform of little h, of course, all right? So I can calculate this directly. The Fourier transform of little h is the sum from i equals 0 to 3 of the values of h, h of i, omega to the minus i. Maybe I shouldn't use i, I should use k. All right, k. Omega to the minus k. All right, that's the, that's the discrete Fourier transform of h. All right? Now, h is easy. h is given explicitly. This is the sum from k equals 0 to 3 of k plus 1. Right, h of 0 is 1, h of 1 is h of 1 is 2, 3, 4, so it's k plus 1 times omega to the minus k. All right? Write this out. 
Write this out in terms of vectors. Write this out. But I won't do it. OK? It's a sum of vectors. K plus 1 times this is a 0. Oh, maybe the 0 is all 1s. Then omega to the minus 1, omega to the minus 2, and so on. And here's what you get. You get very easily, very quickly, you get this equals, I'll write it out for you, 10 minus 2 plus 2i minus 2 and minus 2 minus 2i. All right, just by evaluating the sum, all right, very, very easy. You can do it by hand. Okay? That's what you get. And that tells you exactly, that's the eigenvalue. So the eigenvalues are exactly minus 10, minus 2 plus 2i. That's, that is the eigenvalues of A. The matrix A are given by minus 10, minus 2 plus 2i minus 2, and minus 2, minus 2i. OK? It drops to you like a piece of ripe fruit. And in fact, I just I wasn't so sure of myself. Well, I was sure of myself, of course, but I decided to check this. And if you run this, if you put, if you put, the, put this into math, actually I use Mathematica to test this. And sure enough, if you ask for the eigenvalues of that matrix, this is what you get. All right? So it works like a charm. Once again, how does it work? An LTI system given by convolution, the convolution is also realized by matrix multiplication. This is the matrix. Therefore, eigenvectors of the system are eigenvectors of the matrix. But I know the matrix corresponds to an LTI system, so the eigenvectors are powers of complex exponentials. One, omega, omega squared, omega cubed, all right? And the eigenvalues are the values of the corresponding transfer function at the values, 0, 1, 2, 3. All right? So all I have to do is find the transfer function to find the eigenvalues of this matrix. And to find the transfer function, I calculate the Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform, directly from the definition of the discrete Fourier transform. All right? It's just the, the component of h times omega to the minus k. Add up those vectors, and you get this vector. And the, and the uh, entries here have to be the eigenvalues of the system, okay, of the matrix. It's cute. All right? It's pretty cute. All right. We will now leave the theory of linear systems, as much more as there is to do, and there's plenty more to do. I want to finish up the course with a discussion of higher dimensional Fourier transforms, so we'll start that on Wednesday. As always, please sort of read around and read ahead into the section. So again, our, our, our approach to it is going to try to make it look like the, is going to be to try to make it look as much like the one dimensional case as possible, and that will mean more to you if you sort of read ahead a little bit and familiarize yourself about how the formulas look so I can jump back and forth more easily, okay? See you on Wednesday.